Welcome to this video on temporal bone fractures. Before we begin, consider the following questions. How do injuries sustained across the longitudinal axis of the head differ to those sustained across the transverse axis? What are the potential complications of a temporal bone fracture? How should temporal bone fractures be managed? In what circumstances would you consider facial decompression? And how might you manage the long-term sequelae of temporal bone fractures? Temporal bone fractures typically result from high energy impacts to the skull, often leading to concurrent life-threatening neuronal and systemic injuries due to polytrauma. Fractures from a lateral blow do not require the same magnitude of force as those to the occipital bone, though can still lead to significant complications. In contrast, blows to the occipital bone generally require greater force to cause a temporal bone fracture due to the head's anatomical shape and stronger bone structure in the longitudinal axis. Fractures here often occur from high velocity impacts such as road traffic accidents, which could also cause concurrent temporal bone fractures. Traditionally, temporal bone fractures are described as longitudinal or transverse, depending on the orientation of the fracture relative to the petrous ridge. Transverse fractures typically result from occipital injuries, while longitudinal fractures result from temporal injuries. However, the majority of fractures are mixed with both transverse and longitudinal components. Therefore, considering fractures as otic capsule sparing or otic capsule involving is more clinically relevant. Temporal bone fractures can affect various important structures in and around the temporal bone. Within the temporal bone, it can affect the external auditory canal, causing a step deformity and temporomandibular joint disruption. It may affect the tympanic membrane, resulting in perforation, or the acicular chain, causing a conductive hearing loss. It may injure the skull base, resulting in a CSF otorrhea or rhinorrhea. It can damage the otic capsule, causing a sensory loss and vertigo, or it may affect the facial nerve, resulting in facial paralysis. Additionally, intracranial complications such as epidural or subdural hematoma and brain contusion can occur, as well as extratemporal complications where the fracture line extends to other foramina of the skull base, potentially causing lower cranial neuropathies. Long-term complications include external auditory canal stenosis, where the fracture has caused a step deformity, and acquired implanted cholesteatoma caused by seeding of squamous cells into the fracture line and or the middle ear. Patients with a temporal bone fracture often have other life-threatening injuries and so should be managed by a trauma team with priority given to these other life-threatening injuries. Assessment of such a patient can be challenging, especially if they have reduced consciousness. Clinical signs that may raise suspicion of a skull-based fracture include battle signs, periorbital ecchymosis, CSF otorrhea or rhinorrhea and hematympanum, all of which can be detected even in a comatose patient. Ultimately, the diagnosis is established by a CT scan of the temporal bone, which may demonstrate any temporal bone fractures. The impact of such a fracture may only be elicited later when the patient is responsive enough to assess the hearing and facial nerve function. The facial nerve is most likely to be injured at the first genu, where it makes a sharp bend. Another common site of injury is in the tympanic segment, where the nerve runs horizontally across the middle ear. The decision to surgically decompress the facial nerve in cases of post-traumatic palsy must weigh the potential benefits against the risks, particularly the risk of hearing loss resulting from the acicular chain disruption needed to access the facial nerve to decompress it. Unless there is an obvious step deformity or clear sight of bony impingement causing facial palsy, decompression is best reserved for cases unlikely to improve spontaneously. Palsies that are less than complete do not occur within 72 hours of the injury and do not result in valerian degeneration are more likely to resolve spontaneously. Valerian degeneration occurs when a nerve is severely injured. The portion of the nerve distal to the injury site degenerates over the course of approximately 10 days before regenerating. Less severe injuries do not induce valerian degeneration. Degeneration can be assessed by electromyography EMG, or electroneuronography ENG, approximately 10 days after the injury. With EMG, electrodes are placed over muscles innervated by the facial nerve on both the paretic and healthy sides. The patient is asked to contract these muscles and electrical activity is compared between sides. In ENG, the facial nerve is stimulated and the proportion of action potential conducted is compared between sides. The presence of electrical activity in EMG and evoked responses in ENG can indicate the potential for spontaneous recovery, 
while the absence may suggest a need for surgical intervention. A greater than 90% reduction in amplitude of ENG studies compared to the unaffected side suggests a severe degeneration and may warrant surgical decompression. The bone of the OT capsule is unique in that it does not turn over and therefore a fracture involving the OT capsule will remain present for the remainder of the patient's life. The fracture line is therefore a potential site for bacteria to enter the CNS and so patients with OT capsule involving fractures should receive meningococcus, haemophilus and pneumococcus vaccinations. Hearing loss should be rehabilitated with air conduction or bone conduction hearing aids as appropriate. In patients who have a persistent conductive hearing loss secondary to acicular discontinuity, acicular plasty should also be considered. Patients may require vestibular physiotherapy if they have significant disequilibrium and if there is a persistent facial paralysis they may require referral to a specialist facial function clinic for facial physiotherapy and or reanimation. I hope you found this video to be useful. Please consider subscribing and let us know what you'd like us to cover next.